Hello, everybody. This is the 11th episode of Serpask, series of uh, Serpact. I'm Didu Grigorov, the head of SEO at Serpact. I have 16 years in SEO with a, with a main focus on technical SEO, semantic SEO, and content strategies. Today, we have a really special person as a guest in our Serpask series called Pedro Diaz. I don't know how to present this really, really smart guy because he has so many titles and positions. He's a digital marketer, optimization consultant, usability enthusiast, Google marketing expert. And but the most interesting thing here is that he was part of the Google search quality team and he's one of the persons responsible for, for processing data with a specific goal to help train the Google search algorithms and the Google search results. Hello, Pedro. We're so happy to be here with you. Hello. Thank you for the invitation. That's a long introduction. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve it, uh, of course, because um, you really have a lot of titles and uh, so many qualifications and skills. You're a really amazing person. Um, so let's start first with your personality in details. And let us know how did you start with uh, SEO? What's your background? How did you get into Google? Well, <clears throat> that's a long story. Like, um, I initially, I as I, I have, since I know myself, I have always been a nerd, uh, like to geek and like to program. And but uh, contrary to to the faith, I went into arts. Mm -hmm. when I went to, to university. So I was divided between going into engineering or going towards a uh, more artistic vein. So I decided to go to arts because everyone, like many of my friends were going to engineering and I said, okay, arts might be something that I enjoy because uh, I was quite skillful uh, always with the artistic side as well. Um, I ended up graduating in uh, graphic design. I did uh, post-graduation in communication and image that gave me the branding and product quality background. But still I was mostly on, uh, on the advertising and marketing part until I started with web design. Uh, then I did a web design specialization in the university and it's from there things started to to come together um after a few years of working with uh, as a web designer uh and designer slash web designer in a few agencies in i'm portuguese from portugal um so i was working in lisbon uh for i was uh like uh, three to four years already and uh I saw some uh, job advertising that Google was hiring Portuguese speaking people that they would have to understand the web and uh, how the websites are built and all the stuff behind it. So I decided, oh, I, th I thought Google was uh, only machines. There was very few people there. So <laughs> I said, okay, I'm gonna try and give it a shot and uh, you know, it was like just like one of those crazy things that you do. That you know, it's it's gonna it's 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 uh, a kind of impossible. But I'm just gonna give it a shot because I always had the desire of leaving Portugal and going international and uh, knowing other cultures and having an international experience. And Google was hiring to Ireland, so I sent my CV. And after a, after a month, I got a reply that they wanted to talk with me. So I went through a uh, hops of five to six interviews. And uh, at the end, they said, yeah, we want you here. So I was kind of surprised and happy because uh, it was going, I, I knew that I was going towards something that was not what I had studied for in university, you know, it was like, I had studied arts and communication, and I was going to a to a company that probably wanted me there for my tech background. But that's okay. I I I, I am, although that was not my formation. I, I said okay, that must be interesting. It's not something that I 
can't do, I can't actually do it. So I said, okay. Um, so I went there. Um, uh, I lived in Dublin then for five and a half years as I stayed there. And um, within Google, I started as uh, someone looking at the quality of search results. As a Portuguese speaker, I was mostly responsible for the Portuguese language results, uh, both in Brazil, Portugal, you know, all the Portuguese speaking countries. Um, Portuguese is uh, around the sixth top spoken language worldwide. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I was responsible for overseeing the quality of results. Uh, and, and, and then I went up to spam fighting and then I went up to debugging results to, together with engineering teams, working on closely with more algorithmic solutions and more investigative part of spam fighting. And then that's uh, five and a half years past. I was the kind of the head of uh, communications with Portuguese language market. And um, I came a lot to Brazil to speak on behalf of Google. And mm -hmm. people knew me fairly well here, fairly well here. So that's how I ended up in Google, basically, like uh, my, my, my progress until Google. Um, I left Google in 2011, then September 2011, mm -hmm. uh, at the invitation as a, some colleague of mine that had also uh, left the company. And he said, OK, you know what? We are kind of fairly known in the market. Uh, why don't we go and try to make something of our own? Um, because uh, we, s we were seeing the way agencies and companies operated in this space, uh, mainly regarding SEO and uh, advice on how to perform well in Google. And things were not really up to what we thought was a good work. So we said, you know, there's a really good opportunity for us. So let's do it. And we started the company back in 2012, beginning of 2012. Mm -hmm. And that's history. Now the company, we are around seven, I have around 70 employees here in Brazil. Uh, and we cater um, many of the biggest brands, national, and I already worked with international players as well from United States, from Saudi Arabia, from uh, Portugal, France, Belgium, you know, you name it. So, yeah, that's uh, that's where we are today. <laughs> Seven employees, it's really, uh, so there's so, you, you have so many people working. Yeah, 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 because we don't do just SEO. Of course, the company grew, and then we kind of got together with other ex-Googlers that left Google here in, in Brazil. They they are from the, they were from the ads side. So we got together and now we do uh, Google ads, we do social, we do anything digital. SEO is a big chunk, yes, still. But we do more than SEO now. And uh, yeah, that's why we are so big because we have uh, in total like five to six teams inside. Uh, each team specialized on their own area. Mm -hmm. uh, our audience uh, got us uh, uh, many questions about your work uh, related to the training of algorithms. Can you share a little bit more details there? But of course, we know that uh, all Googlers are under a very solid NDA. So mm -hmm. uh, feel free to share whatever you think it could be shared. What I think it could be shared. <laughs> Let's see. So Google, um, since uh, and it is public information. Google always um, aimed at solving problems at scale. They want to solve everything at scale. And humans are not good at that because we are not very good at multitasking. We, some of us are, but not that much as a computer. Um, mm -hmm. And we don't have the, we cannot be as fast or mm -hmm. as uh, quick or as effective as a machine. 
because we need to sleep, we need to eat, we get tired, we get cranky, all the stuff that comes with humans. So um, humans are good to making non-binary decisions. Mm -hmm. um, machines are not good for non-binary decisions. So that's why we complement each other. Um, Google wants to solve the problems algorithmically means that they need humans to sometimes catch what algorithms don't catch or tell algorithms, hey, you need to adjust here or there. So that's what usually Google's approach as algorithmic, um, uh, as an algorithmic approach. Like they look at a problem and say, okay, what are the, um, what do people do when they do this task? And they put an algorithm looking at the person doing this and they say, okay, follow what the main points that the person does when they are doing this task. And so the algorithms learn what is the behavior of a human when they need something or when they are doing something or they are searching for something. Um, and they try to validate that. Um, the job of a human is, like I said in earlier, is to look at an algorithm and say, okay, you are doing a good job or you are not doing a good job because you are catching stuff that you shouldn't be catching or you are leaving too much stuff that you are not catching. Right? What you know as false positives or false negatives. So at, from, from a quality standpoint, it's the same. Like you have a bunch of sites that you say these sites are really crappy, although they are not doing anything spammy because it's like that you don't really have something that is really like you say, oh, there is too many keywords. There is uh, 200 keywords instead of just 100. There's like a cut, there's, no, there's not a real cut line, but you put off many of them together and it can build patterns, uh, patterns around, um, organization of information, patterns around user behavior, patterns around um, amount of information, uh, format of information, um, you name it. There's a lot of stuff that algorithms can look at. Um, and so when you put all this together and you train the algorithms to do these things, uh, it all depends what you want to assess. If you want to assess quality, you have to put humans also interacting with things. So because quality, uh, everybody thinks that Google says what it's quality. Everybody thinks that Google dictates quality. Google doesn't say this site is quality or this site is not quality. Actually, people do. You know, Google yes. looks at people that interact with websites and yes. Google yes. judges people's behavior and what people do when they visit those sites. And from there, they infer quality on what people do, not what on the sites. So it's an indirect approach. Many people say, oh, Google says what is quality or not. No, people do. And Google just looks at people. So that's, that's basically um, how Google approaches algorithmic, uh, how, can I, how I can explain this without opening a lot of confidential stuff that I would have to go through. Uh, yeah. So uh, many people started talking about machine learning recently on their box, especially the official tools. And uh, what do you think uh, about that? Uh, is it really true that Google almost completely switched to the machine learning just before starting our main topic for today? Um... Google has always been very strong in machine learning. Um, as I said earlier, they aim to solve everything at scale. So it makes sense. Um, machine learning is a way to program algorithms that doesn't require as much human intervention as creating algorithms, because you let the machine learn by itself. Uh, the, the problem is that when you have to diagnose what went wrong, it's also more difficult, because you don't know why the machine learned something like that. You have to go and you have to find the beginning of the line to say to fo and follow it until it goes wrong. And that's a lot, a lot of work. So Google started with machine learning experiences 
before I got into Google. I got into Google in 2006. Uh, mm -hmm. in February 2000, uh, March 2006. Mm -hmm. And they were already doing machine learning stuff back then. And But it was mostly applied at translation, spam fighting, so things that would then be presented to a human to judge the output. Uh, the machine would do the thing and they would present it to a human. Um, it was very heavy in, in spam fighting as well. Uh, but mostly it was Google Translate that was the, one of the most heavy mm -hmm. things of machine learning um, in natural language processing and all of this stuff. Um, but nowadays, I think Google is very careful. They, they are very good at it. But as once, uh, actually, my business partner, which is an ex-Googler also, is an engineer. And he is an automation engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, and he often, uh, one, one, one phrase that he often tells, and I uh, remember very well, is that in automation, um, the hard part is not automated, is, is not the automation itself, but mm -hmm. controlling the output. Yes. If yes, you yes. don't control the output, your automation is crap. Because you can, you know, it's very easy to automate something. The, the, the hard part is to control the result of that output. And that's usually something that's, um, uh, you can see that going wrong in many times with what SEOs do. They want to automate a lot of stuff. And when it comes out, the quality is not as we would want it. So automating is hard. Uh, Controlling the result is harder. Um, so that said, machine learning is a, a form of, of automation and which takes a bit of human control from the learning process, from the building process. In that regard, Google wants to start to apply things where they have high confidence that this kind of automation is not gonna screw, them, screw the whole picture or screw the whole results. So that's why they, when they started with experiments with rank brain, they only applied to this kind of negative queries that Google would not catch. Um, mm -hmm. Like Gary said, a few examples like how to, it was a how to go past Mario Kart without cheats or something like this without, was, and Google was not able to understand uh, that without was a relevant. Uh, uh, piece on the query for those results to be presented. So uh, in this case, the, out, the machine learning and all this, this, this part of more advanced was implemented on this little part of uh, retrieving results that Google is not really good at getting. But it doesn't mean that they have gone full machine learning, no. They are very careful, I believe, and this is my opinion, yeah? They are very careful with that because they don't want to uh, suddenly have something out of their control that they can't understand why something happened. So that's, that, that's my perception why they are very, being very cautious. Doesn't mean that they are not running experiments and that what we see uh, on a daily basis does, is not influenced by machine learning at some, at some point because Google experiments many times per day, different algorithms with different sets of people. Um, they run experiments constantly, constantly, nonstop, 24 seven. And they select sets of people to which they present those experiments. So what I see on a given day is not gonna be the same that I see tomorrow and it's not be the same that probably my colleague which is sitting two chairs away from me might be might be seeing, he might be seeing something different. It already happened here in our team. Uh, they are sitting across me and they are seeing something that is being shown to them because they are logged in in their account and I cannot see it or vice versa. Um, mm -hmm. So that's how basically it, it's impossible like to track and say that this is a machine learning experiment or this is not or this is something that 
I should be taking for granted because it's something that Google is ranking this way. No. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we really love um, analyzing and reading the documents on the AI Google uh, platform. And uh, two of the documents were very interesting to us, the DRRM algorithm for enhanced contextual contextuality between the phrases and the documents and the BERT algorithm too. Uh, so uh, that's why we think that they're trying maybe successfully implementing the machine learning more and more, especially into understanding the queries of the, of the users. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, maybe this problem you mentioned as, as a support uh, uh, statement to what you said, uh, they have already resolved it, or maybe let's say it's 70 to 80% is resolved because of the, the new BERT algorithm. It's actually a complex of algorithms, uh, yeah. of algorithms there. Uh, because they now understand a little bit, or let's say way better the, the context between the words than the queries, the phrases, and the documents. And I think it's a big leap. It's a big leap when it comes to understanding the semantics and the, uh, this contextual part of the, of the search experience. Yeah, definitely. And, and Google is going, look, going towards, um, you know, Google, um, uh, some people understand that Google is, um, there was this misunderstanding or miscomprehension of what Google is. Google is not just a search engine. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it's always been there in front of us in, in, in the mission. The, mm -hmm. the mission statement of Google is organize the world's information and make it, you. Uh, universally accessible and useful. It's the world's information. It's not the internet's information. It's the world's information. That, yeah. That's a very big uh, thing to consider and not to miss. Because if we assume that Google is just organizing the internet, we are gonna be uh, looking at a very small subset of what Google wants to achieve. And Google wants to organize the world's information. And that means the information on the web, information outside the web, the information, mm -hmm. where, where, wherever there is information, they want to get there and organize it and present it. And yes. that's why we see, uh, that's why SEOs complain, you know, because then Google starts to change the way they, they show results. It starts to show other kinds of information and say, oh, wait a minute, wasn't it just web information? No, it has never been just web information. It has been there all along in their mission statement. You just didn't write it properly. Um, so, yeah. yeah. OK, uh, let's start with the topic uh, for today. And thank you for this really, really valuable information you shared about Google, because our audience was really interested in this. Um, let's start with the information architecture and your favorite topic from what, is, what we have seen from your website. Mm -hmm. um, Let's start first uh, explaining what is actually an information architecture for a website. We're both with you, Google product experts uh, on the Webmaster Forum, and uh, we've seen many times on the trees that people are, um, they, don't, they don't really understand it properly. So let's explain it, and we hope we, uh, we have some of these users here on the webinar, but Let's understand. Uh, let's explain it uh, in more details what exactly it is for the websites. So, in a very short sentence, architecture information is how to organize things. Basically, how humans organize information, um, and it's the it's a practice of deciding how to organize something, a system or a set of information, so that everything is understandable. Uh, for example, when you design a website, is the process of designing where things are, how your information builds on other information, or what information comes first, what information comes after, from a human's perspective, mostly. Obviously, many of these things, when you work on them and you don't consider machines, you tend to leave some things out, out uh, for, 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 for some that, that are good for information architecture, but they are not so good for search engines. That's why 
historically there's always been kind of a ego fight between um, architecture information and digital information or you'd say uh, technical information um, mm -hmm. because how you organize technically information for a machine it's not always the same as for a human uh, but if you look at if, if you only organize for a machine um, humans would not be able to consume it uh, an example is um, for a machine uh, if you look at the HTML code or CSS code or whatever, you know, if you compact it and pass it to a minification, everything gets like without spaces and un un not unformatted and everything, and the machine can still read it. Just humans can't because it's going to be very hard for a human to 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 recognize format. So. Information architecture is something that, as user experience or as accessibility in these areas, they extrapolate the digital world. They are also applied to the digital world, but they go beyond it. Uh, it's how we organize everything around us. It's how what makes sense for us on the street to see, who, to decide which street is larger, which street is smaller, or where cars go and bikes go and, and you know what's a truck what's a car what's a what's a, 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 a bike um, so this kind of information architecture is basically de deciding hierarchies uh, either in a structure or on a system and kind of organizing the information so it's understandable to humans so basically that's what infor architecture information architecture is uh, it takes it it um, it takes um, uh, things from 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 other areas like library science like mm -hmm. uh, how to organize books this is part of mm -hmm. information ar architecture what you have as a as an index is information architecture Cognitive psychology, like what is the amount of information a, pers a person can process at any time. This is also important. Uh, architecture, like uh, location, uh, we organize things basically by to a limit of um, five. We, humans can organize information up to five methods. Like we are, can organize things by location, like. Uh, uh, French wine, Argentinian beef, it's location. Yeah, uh, We can organize things alphabetically, like from A to Z. We can organize things by chronologically, by time, like uh, two-hour meeting, two, two days. This is a, chronology, uh, a time organization. You can organize by category, like topics, formats, whatever it fits in a category. And you can organize by hierarchy or magnitude is meaning like size price all of this is um big or small um so those are basically the five ways humans can organize information and if we we have to apply this when we work with machines too because machines are supposed to feed information back to us and if they don't feed us information in a way that we understand it then there's no use on using machines for us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, many people uh, relate the information architecture of a website with the main navigation of the website. Mm -hmm. Think about this connection and do you think it's true? Not really. Um, yes and no. Um, navigation and information architecture are complementary. They are not, they, can be different. You can have um, an, an, a, a hierarchy on a website, an architecture, and a navigation that does not 100% follow that architecture because sometimes it doesn't make sense. An example is you can have a third level directory on a website, like you have a 
domain, you have a folder, a subfolder, and a third folder. And you can link that third folder from your home page. It's still a third folder subdirectory in the information architecture, but navigationally it's linked from your home page. It's not three clicks in. So, uh, and this creates some kind of misconceptions. For example, uh, SEOs say that long URLs are bad because it takes too many clicks to get to to, the, to them. Not true. A long URL can be linked from the home page, and mm -hmm. you have it linked. You have a you have a three directory URL, and it has a hierarchy, and it's still linked from your home page. It has one, one only one click away. So it's a misconception that we have to um, tear apart because it, it's not true, and we SEOs need to stop selling this kind of myths uh, because they need to understand what's behind and how these areas work before they jump on them and distort what actually they are these areas are supposed to do mm -hmm. uh, we uh, very recently uh, and not only maybe even the previous previous years uh, we have talked on the forums and not only also publicly about the best practices for main navigation uh, menus on the website as i said uh, they are uh, the information architecture and the uh, main navigation they're complementary so our question here how they complement each other can you give an ex an example to our audience or just an example with any any website maybe and uh, can you share some really best practices for organization of uh, main navigation of a website Maybe something from Google point of view or whatever you can share here. So the thing is, um, we have to understand. Um, for it's like it's hard to to share like a good example because each area, each vertical, each business has a different way of organizing. Because, for example, you organize your dishes in a way that you organize your book collection. Yeah. Uh, so, if you sell dishes and if you sell books, you're going to organize them differently on your website. So, the, the main point is to understand how people organize that kind of information that you are going to have on your website. What are people used to? Not, do not break conventions. Do not reinvent the wheel of what people are used to when they deal with this kind of information. Do not sell tires the same way you would sell perfumes because it's not going to make sense for users that arrive on your website and are, have to select tires by their color because or by their smell. It doesn't work. People don't organize tires by smell. Um, so first you have to understand what you are having on your website or what you are presenting. So then you can create a model that makes sense for your users. So. This is the main principle to have to, to have in consideration when you are creating a model for information architecture. There's not really like a, a way that you say, this is the best way for this or this is the best way for that. No, you have to research users and understand what, 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 what makes them uh, understand your product. So, mm -hmm. and then for machines, for Google, for, for Google, you have to consider two things. Uh, we have Google considers relevancy and reputation when they look at the website. So relevancy is what's on the website, how the information is connected to each other. And reputation is how that information is right on the home page or is a few pages in. Yeah. So for example, information on the home page, it's probably much more um important or reputable than information three levels in because that's how hierarchically also things work um, you put you build a hierarchy based on importance as as well so um, when you design information architecture for a website what you have to take in consideration is you should always try to respect hierarchy of information and then you decide 
if some hierarchy of information should be present at a higher level and link it from there. Like I said in a while, you can have a three level deep URL and link it from the homepage. So that's how you decide basically from a Google's perspective and you are telling Google, okay, this information is three levels in, but for my website, this is really important. And so I'm gonna, although it's not present on my homepage, uh, it's right here for you to see it firsthand. Um, so yeah, I think that the main point is like have have in your in your head that uh, uh, hierarchy and navigation are complementary. They can uh, they can help each other, and you can use these two to say Google to tell Google or tell search engines which information is important. And that's what search engines advise you. Like they say, if something is important, put it on your homepage or put it, don't put it very deep. So yeah, you have to consider, okay, I'm selling uh, tires or I'm selling perfumes. So what's, what's the main information of my products that I want to pull closer to the homepage, but still maintain hierarchically organized so when users come, they are not overwhelmed with all the information that I show them and they can follow the trail to find naturally and understand the organization of the website. Um, so it's all about the uh, user experience maybe and how the users are um, going from a page to page, how they consume the content, what's their behavior on the pages, something like that? Sorry, I didn't understand the, the, your question. Uh, so it's all about the user experience, mm -hmm. in other words, and how people are consuming, how they interact with that content. Yes, the, yes, actually, the... yes, uh, information architecture is, is part of the whole user experience thing. Uh, it takes, mm -hmm. as user experience is like how you experience something, is how you feel about using a service, doing something, using a website, using a system doing a task, uh, how you feel about the brand. That, that's, mm -hmm. you, that's the whole user experience. Uh, and if you look at the user experience Honeycomb, I don't know how, if you are familiarized with this Pit, uh, Peter Morville uh, mm -hmm. Honeycomb of your information user experience. Uh, inside they have uh, usability, desirability, credibility, accessibility, findability, and usefulness. And all of these things create the experience, which is the value, which is for humans, it's what we call quality. Um, mm -hmm. Because quality is different for me as it is for, for you or it is for anyone. We, we don't know human as the same standard of quality because quality is relative to what I know in, around me, what I know in the world, the experiences that I've had, if I always went to luxury hotels, uh, mm -hmm. another luxury hotel is not going to be really, really high quality for me. It's just going to be the same. Uh, mm -hmm. But if I only went to one-star hotels, if suddenly I go to a five-star hotel, it's going to be really high quality. Um, or not. Or maybe I feel really good at uh, one-star hotels and I find it more quality because it's what I'm used to and what I feel comfortable. So it's a very relative thing. Uh, and information architecture is part of this. It's how you organize this. What the user ex is how you organize the information that's inside of the user experience. So, yes, it, it, it's it's all part of this 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 system, and that's how I why usually SEOs get mad at me uh, when I say that to understand more SEO you have to look more into these areas of information architecture and web accessibility and usability because they give you background that explains you what you are doing and why you are doing it. And it's not, if you look at it and you will read a book about this, you suddenly realize, oh, it's not just about SEO. It is not, not just about search engines because search engines decided that because it was good for humans. And so this is also present on this all these areas that of study so yeah 
it's all connected in 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 the end and uh, uh the best resources that i find to study seo are these areas that kind of give me background and give me the pillar knowledge that makes me understand why i'm solving a problem uh, can you share some examples of good books about the information architecture yes uh there are quite a few that is like uh one of is uh, Jesse James Garrett is one of the guy main guys of information architecture. Then the book is called Experience Design in Information Architecture. So you can you can check that out. Um, there is the um, there is also good websites that I recommend. Um, the architecture information the Information Architecture uh, Institute, who mm -hmm. is you. Um, IA Institute, there's the UI Institute, but this is user interface experience. It's different. Mm -hmm. um, and there's the um, there's the um, there's a website of the, I think, American government about information architecture too. Mm -hmm. Not, but no, I don't have the link. But yes, I, I believe if you if you search for just James Garrett and their their books, there are, those are the main sources of information that most of the people use nowadays. So I recommend starting from there because it's a really good resource. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, one funny uh, dispute we usually have here uh, when we work on our clients, and it is uh, about how, for example, information about the company should be, uh, should be organized. Let's say, for example, we have an About Us page, and uh, we usually start arguing about that, for example, they can place everything on, on the same page, but the opposite side will start arguing about, no, we have uh, we have to create dedicated pages. So what would be your advice here? A one page for everything or dedicated pages? Uh, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> that's, that's, that's something that, again, you cannot make a recipe out of it. It's how how long can you talk about yourself or how long can you talk about a product until it's start stops to be relevant for your users for example again if you think on a, on and on how users organize things and let's go back to the tire example when you have a tire you can say a lot of things about a tire you can say about the rubber you can say about the dimensions you can say about this for what type of pavement is for rain, is for snow. You can say about the ridges, you can say about the durability. But then if you take one of these little um, characteristics, like say snow tires, yeah, you know, snow tire with high durability, whatever. Uh, as, as you go down the being more and more specific, how much can you really still have content about that? Mm -hmm. So as you become more specific, the, the content that you have about something also starts to be less. It's more narrow because you start to go to be more and more and more and more specific until you reach the point that you, that you want. Uh, so it's how, how granular do you want to be how capillarized do you want your site to be? That's that's and that's uh, the limit that you have to set. Okay, you know, maybe it makes sense to have tire, a page about tires or tires for snow, but maybe it doesn't make sense to have tires for snow five years duration with uh, two hundred and fifty five radius, and you know, you, you start not to have any more content to talk about this little piece of information so it's again there's no good measure that says you should stop here or you should go that far it's looking at your content and say how much uh, division is good for my users does this go uh, towards what they are searching they are still searching for this kind of thing or not mm -hmm. um, Keyword research is a really good help for to start with that. You understand what users search for and you group them and say, okay, does it still make sense to 
take this chunk of keywords and make another page and I'm going to have a, another topic without being without seeming that I'm being very repetitive or the information on the page is not going to be that much useful or this is not something that really users will search for you know uh, ooh, a lot of questions uh, from our audience. Um, there is really, actually one really, really interesting question. How the information architecture impacts the SEO strategy of a website? Well, I, I would say a lot because, again, if you don't organize the information of a website the way people understand this organization or the way that people are used to this organization of information, it's very likely that Google as a machine also is not going to connect this information as humans would. So as humans type a query into Google to find your website, Google is not going to be able to bring your website as prominently as it would if your site would be better organized. And information architecture is not just about the URLs and three levels deep or hierarchy is also about the information on a page. What comes first, the he heading tag, the H1, and then there's a H2, and then there's the body text. And you are not gonna invert all these things because it's not gonna make sense. So this is information architecture. It's organization, not only of hierarchies on a website structure, but also on a page, on a layout is also information architecture. It's layout architecture. So you you build a layout and what the hierarchy of information that comes first and after. So it's understandable and relevant and makes sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you provide some actionable tips uh, for our audience? Uh, something you can make in general so they can use it. Let's say maybe three or five tips, no more, nothing more. Uh, how to start uh, working on the improvement of their information architecture. Well, most of the time is look at your page. Don't look at your, don't, we have to stop looking at keywords on a page and you have to mm -hmm. start looking at your page as a whole and see if it, the topic that comes first makes sense with the topic that comes after. Because nowadays, 2019 and going forward, we are overwhelmed with information everywhere. People are overwhelmed with information on the internet, on the radio, on the TV. I bookmark a lot of stuff that I never read. I put <laughs> a lot of stuff in my... And why do I never read? Because I don't remember anymore. Because it's too long and I don't have the time. And I decide if I'm going to read something. But because I scan it first. I'm going to go to a page. I'm going to scroll from top to bottom to see if it looks more or less like what I want to read. If it looks like more or less what I want to read, then I'm going to start to read the titles and say, does it still go in the direction that I want to go? Yes. Then I'm going to read a paragraph. And then, then I'm going to decide, okay, this is good. I'm going to read it. Because if the previous checkpoints of me scanning the information I don't pass, I'm not going to read this information. So you have to, to look at the web page and say, okay, does it make sense that I organize the information in this way? What, and, and again, what's a table must be a table. What's an image must be an image. And do not put everything in text just because it has to be for Google. Uh, Google also deals well with tabulated information on a, on a, on a table. Um, if you have to put an image, um, for example, we are here, we are dealing with a price comparison in Brazil. We have one of the biggest clients that they run a price comparison. And what a price comparison does is they tell users uh, what to buy, which, which, which device to buy or what to choose. But not only based on price. Price is one of the things. You have to give some other points of information for the user to make a decision. 
So, for example, having a table with pros and cons of a product is a really good way not to have a block of text explaining why this product is bad. You laid it out very succinctly in a resumed way. The, the user is going to look at that and it's going to be really happy because they are going to be able to understand the pros and cons of the product without having to go through the effort of reading a whole paragraph of text. Of text. So this is comes with the, if the format of the information that you are showing to the users. And sometimes we forget to think about the format of the information. We mm -hmm. put a lot of information on the page and we say, we forget to think, is this the format that the user expects to consume this information? Or would it make more sense to have this information laid out in another format that would be easier for the user to consume it without such a bigger effort? So that's the, the best advice that I can give nowadays to whomever is working with SEO and organizing information on a page. And we seem to to forget that people consider the format of content before they consume it. So you have also to think about format of content before you build it. And uh, let's summarize uh, all this valuable and uh, significant information that you shared with us, and we're very thankful for that. Um, we, uh, as SEO specialists and Google, uh, usually advise create a page with a purpose, mm -hmm. not just for a keyword because it's searchable. What is your opinion on that? It's really, really important for our, our audience to understand it. How would you explain this uh, in the position of an like, Google word? Well, very basically, like, think of your page, go to your pages and ask yourself, what does what problem does this page solve? What what value am I giving to the user that visits this page? What is the user taking from here? And if you don't have any value or if your page doesn't solve any problem, then probably you should not have that page. Uh, don't Do not build a page just for the keywords. The page has to have a purpose. And usually the purpose is solving a problem. And we forget this and we go and build a page just for our keywords and we then wonder why it does not rank in Google because, uh, and not only that, if you, if you want to go a step further, uh, think like, okay, I'm building a page that solves a problem, but the problem that I am solving, has it been solved already by someone else? What am I doing different from my competitors? Because you have to think like, if your site disappears today, what would your users miss from your site that they would not find in your competitors? Or is it as easy for them just to go to a page on your competitor and find exactly the same information? So we have to do go this step further and think about this not only am I solving a problem, I am solving a problem that nobody else is solving. So this is the one of the main reasons to have a web page or to have a website or to have a business is create value. Yeah, this is uh, maybe the most important uh, rule we have to cover every time. So we have a funny part in our webinars actually, and it's sharing uh, an image related to our guests in some way, okay. and also providing uh, interesting uh, old stuff. Uh, so, how would you, um, <laughs> what kind of old type would you have to this image? Oh boy, uh, what kind of old type do I have to this image? Uh, wandering, uh, <laughs> Portuguese guy wandering, <laughs> or thoughtful. I want to know. I would say it's someone wondering or someone thinking about something. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of, I think that's the hot tag that I would have. Obviously not to, this is a new budget about me to have my name on it as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
you actually use this photo uh, very often on yes. the same right? and uh, it is really kind of uh, in a, it, it makes you not that uh, not that boring person as you uh, as we usually see the scientific persons in the in the search industry at all but uh, more uh, funny and uh, more easy going more user friendly more uh, um, talkative and uh, you're actually very talkative and very uh, uh, very friendly person so uh, oh, it's you. really yeah it's really make your uh, image uh, so positive and <laughs> <laughs> it makes people smile actually <laughs> this is what is good uh, that's why we decided to take this photo because um, you're really kind of wondering you're smiling at the same time yeah I like I like I like to be I, I like a lot I tend to be sarcastic sometimes, ironic, uh, in a way that doesn't offend people because sometimes you can offend people by being sarcastic or ironic. Uh, so uh, I like to I like uh, I, I like to joke on things a lot. Uh, I think it's, it's it's a culture that I always had like be playful with the people that surround you, and yeah, that's that probably that's why this image captures so much kind of the spirit that I take with things. Um, I, I question a lot as well. I question mm -hmm. a lot things. Uh, probably you have seen me questioning a lot other SEOs on, in the market, like, why do you think this is like that? Why don't you put it this way? Or when they, I, I one thing that really bugs me and probably that, that picture reflects a lot is like when we, when SEOs come with statements, you know, like, this is like that. And sometimes it's not because there are nuances. Uh, the, the, the most uh, given answer by SEOs is it depends because it depends on a lot of stuff. And you cannot just give a blank statement that saying that, oh, uh, I don't know, Google considers CTR because it, <laughs> it's not just going to be like that. It, it has more nuances to this. And if you put it like this, and if you lay it like, blank statements to people that are learning, they are going to get used to go after recipes instead of going after the, the skills to solve problems. Uh, they go, need to go after the skills to solve problems. And to have skills to solve a problem, you need to understand how things work. Mm -hmm. uh, and why do they work that way? Uh, yeah. The best way to solve something is to understand why does it work that way and what can I do to influence it rather than just following a recipe of someone that told you that this works this way. And that's why I'm so against, yeah, and I use that image as a, you know, look really? and you're like, really? Yes, yeah, like. <laughs> we usually walk, walk, uh, walk walking when uh, we see, for example, that some, somebody uh, making some statements like they're totally true and we have to take them uh, granted. And if you ask the person over a personal message, uh, uh, have you tested this? How uh, do you know it? And so on. And he will reply, because I've read it in search engine journal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, nothing compares to search engine journal, actually. Uh, but uh, as you said, it all depends. It all depends on many, many different factors. Uh, not the ranking factors, <laughs> to, be, to be misunderstood, not the ranking factors, but different factors, like I said, the user experience, the, maybe the niche, the website, of the brand, the reputation, yes. and so on. Uh, so I would like to say thank you so much for being with us again today and for sharing your amazing knowledge and tips, uh, both from your uh, professional practice and uh, solid background, and of course from your... Uh, so sorry, ex, uh, background as an ex, uh, like expert. And, uh, uh, also would like to say thank you everybody for being with us today. Thanks to our team for their great work for realizing this webinar and for our delay and postponing the webinar uh, because it was intended to be the, the previous week. Um, thanks, for, uh, thanks to our moderators and our sponsor, uh, Serpact. We will be expecting you next month to and very soon we will announce our next guest. Meanwhile, don't forget to follow us on YouTube where we can find a lot of useful knowledge and information in our past series and episodes. Don't forget to follow also 
Pedro because he's a really smart guy. And uh, you can read so much knowledgeable, uh, so much valuable information there. I have won a lot from Pedro actually. Uh, we know each other more from the webmaster um, forums. And uh, uh, we are so happy that uh, he accepted our invitation today. Today, uh, we hope we will see you again here uh, after a period of time. And again, thank you. Thanks very much uh, for sharing your knowledge with us. For the invitation, thank you for having me. And I think we all should learn, be learning constantly because the moment you think that you know everything is the moment you stop learning. I learn yes. every day from people I work with, uh, although that I have more experience in some areas, but I learn from them. So yeah, learning, that's good. And Pedro, please don't stop sharing your uh, variable tweets on, on Twitter because they're really, uh, you can share a lot of and very, uh, very valuable knowledge uh, with tweets uh, and uh, they're mixed with sarcasm. And when you mix with sarcasm, this is really interesting. You catch the user uh, attention that way and uh, you really make people thinking about a specific issue or a problem or something like that, which is totally great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.